So you're releasing Llama 3 today. Um, talk a little bit about what is involved in that release. Yeah. Um, so we did something really, really exciting this time around. Um, we are releasing an updated 8 billion parameter model plus a 70 billion parameter model. Um, and these are state of the art. They're they're incredible, high performing models. They're they're at their scale. Some you know uh, we we feel really really good about how they're they're performing. And, and in order to get there, you know we did all the right um, uh, foundational work to to be able to scale and build these models. We had the right clusters, the right infrastructure. We had the right training frameworks. We did all the right um, data work. And so we're really really excited to be introducing these. And if you think about how these um, AI models are trained, they're trained in two phases. There's this process that's called pre-training. That's where um, you're basically trying to consume general knowledge. Uh, and then there's the post-training effort, which, be, which we call, uh, which involves some human uh, supervision. That's where you tell the model how to behave. Um, and we did a lot of work, and we learned a lot of things, both from um, Llama 2, and the community gave us like really great feedback on Llama 2, uh, also from Connect um, and introducing our products uh, to the world. Um, and we all that sort of fed into the alignment work that we do um, uh, for, for Llama 3. The other thing that we also did is, you know, historically we've introduced Llama 2 as a, as a model, and then in Connect we introduced our products. This time around we're actually bundling those together, and we built Llama 3 with Meta AI which is our assistant um, in mind, right? And Meta AI is going to be the you know um, one of the best, um, if not the best, uh, assistant that's available for uh, for free, so everybody right. can access it. You know, the seventy billion is a magical number that allows us to scale to billions of people, and so we're really excited that we've been able to strike the right balance between intelligence and efficiency. Um, and so, so, when you're and, talking about these large numbers of parameters, what does that mean? Um, that's just the that's the number of weights that are required uh, to sort of embed or represent knowledge in the model. It's the capacity of the model to sort of uh, contain information, um, and it's also most importantly the uh, amount. It usually references the amount of um, uh, hardware that you need to to run the model. So an eight billion parameter model is if is small enough to sort of run on phones or even laptops at, at the higher end uh, of those. And then the 70B is something that you can run on a, on a um, uh, usually in the cloud, but on, on less hardware, which lets you serve more users. And just for those unfamiliar, talk a little bit about these weights. You know, it's a lot of weights involved. What are these weights? Um, well, <laughs> at their simplest level, they're just matrix multiplies, but, um, uh, but, but, Effectively, what you're, what these weights are doing is they are, um, they are encoding or representing human knowledge. So, so in the, in the training process, you are um, uh, showing the model uh, lots and lots of uh, text information, and and uh, what you're trying to do is teach these weights to predict um, the next word in a sequence of words, in a sentence. So if I say, hello, how are you to, or how are you? And I leave the today out. Um, we're teaching the model to build relationships, to learn rep, uh, relationships between the words to predict the word today. Um, and so when you go through that process, the model starts to in, like learn relationships between different concepts, to learn relationships between different um, uh, domains of information. And you scale it across all domains. So you're not just learning how are you today, but you're also learning, you know, um, global facts and humanities and mathematics. And you sort of like learn all of this knowledge. Uh, and these weights are basically learning to uh, compute the relationship between these different concepts. And during the alignment process, that's where you can start to teach the model to answer prompts or to, to behave in a certain way that's more conversational. And so then how do you build in or train it with these weights? Not sure. Maybe, what do you mean? My question is, so you've built these models with billions of weights. So how, does, how do you include the weights in the models? Talk a little bit about that training process. So if the model is going to understand the relationship between these different entities, what do you do to teach it that? Um, 
so so what we do is we initialize random weights and then we like start to do something called uh, gradient descent, which is you predict a word and you compute the error between the word you predicted. The model predicted some like random word. You tell it you wanted to predict another word and then you do and then you try to teach you update the weights, you, you update the numbers inside of the weights to basically converge to higher and higher precision. Hmm. And so this process usually is what we call in pre, it's it's what happens during pre-training. But we update those weights um, in order to minimize the distance between what your predicted value is and what the actual value is. Um, right. And that process usually does some level of convergence, and we train it over thousands of GPUs and trillions of tokens. So if you look at something like um, the 8 billion and, and, and uh, 70 billion, they were trained on almost 15 trillion uh, tokens. And tokens, roughly, you can imagine as a word, so roughly like... Um, 15 trillion words, which is an incredible outcome, and it requires thousands of GPUs to train it on. And a GPU is, is you know, um, uh, roughly the cost of, like, an Audi, <laughs> is what I call it, an Audi A3 or something like that. But they're very, very expensive. And so, like, being able to operate these large-scale infrastructure um, uh, training jobs is, is quite a feat of both engineering and science. Yeah, so this is coming from Meta's own publication. So you use to 24,000 GPU clusters, I believe, to train Llama 3. So just give us a, a, an idea of how big that actually is. It's a lot of GPUs. That is a, a lot, a lot of GP, a lot of GPUs. Um, we're very fortunate, again, at Meta to have access to, we're, we're, we're a vertically integrated company, so we actually have access to our own um, infrastructure all the way down to the GPUs. And so our ability to optimize up and down the stack to build the world's best models is like second to none. It's really quite a special place from that perspective. Um, and these clusters are a demonstration of that capability, right? Our ability right. to basically build interconnected, uh, and this is like interconnected, what I mean by that is how, how fast can these GPUs talk to each other? Because you get into a bottleneck, uh, first bottleneck would be like, you know, how, how powerful is a single GPU? And then the second bottleneck is how quickly can you have these um, GPUs talk to each other? Um, and we're quite fortunate to be able to optimize up and down the stack to, to basically make it efficient to, to run these um, models. Yeah, for listeners, Mark Zuckerberg, Meta CEO, talked about how Meta is going to have something like 650,000 GPU <laughs> or GPU yeah. equivalents by the end of this year. So yeah. this training took a huge chunk of them, but <laughs> nothing close to the full war chest. Which yeah. is just amazing if each one of those is an Audi equivalent, something like yeah. twenty to forty thousand dollars each. Yeah. So then talk a little bit about what it takes to get from Llama two to Llama three. Right. If you want to basically this the the idea is you're working to build a more powerful model. Does that mean you need you just need more GPUs and more training data? Or is there something else that goes on behind the scenes to make these models more powerful? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of hard science that happens in the background. And one of the amazing things about our approach at Meta is we're, we're very open. So, um, you know, following this release, there will be a research paper where we share a lot of um, our learnings and, and efforts that we've, we've encountered as we went from Llama 2 to Llama 3. I think we were very open about Llama 1 to Llama 2. You know, Llama 1 to Llama 2 is all about alignment and figuring out how to balance one of the hardest problems in the field is like usefulness versus safety and figuring out how to encourage the model to be useful and answer questions but not um, not answer the wrong questions. And, um, and so we've been uh, really, really focused on pushing the science and the infrastructure and the systems engineering to achieve this level of scale. So we've introduced the 8 and 70 is really just the beginning of our Llama 3 train. We also are talking a little bit about one of the larger models that we're training that is already achieving, you know, um, exceptional uh, performance, um, which is a, it's a it's a model that's over 400 billion parameters, um, and and these models yeah. have basically been trained on 10x more compute, 10x more data, uh, which is a which is a quite a feat to to go from Llama two to Llama three and under. Uh, what is it like six months or so, six to eight months, um, and scale to that level. So our pace is actually really, really, really good. Um, and so I think that's been our primary focus moving from two to three is just, you know, really, really uh, doing a good job of our fundamentals, which should allow us to continue scaling into the future in a really um, effortless way. 
So just to put a fine point on that, 10 times more computing resources for the three, the Islama three models. So actually, I think it's, uh, I believe it's a hundred times more compute. So okay. A hundred times more compute yeah. and then 10 times more data. Yeah. Is there is okay. Let's talk about the data actually, because, um, this has been a big conversation topic in terms of, are we going to run out of data to train these models? And there was a recent New York Times article that went into this. I'd love to get you to respond to it. So they actually have you uh, saying uh, in a meeting that you've used almost every available, this is from the New York Times, almost every available English language book, essay, poem, and news article on the internet to develop a model. And that uh, Meta could not match ChatGPT unless it gets more data. And there was even some debate of paying $10 a book for the full licensing rights to new titles and even a discussion of buying Simon and Schuster, the publishing house, uh, to feed these models. Where are you do, you, do you think, in terms of your ability to train these models with, with more data? Because the sense is that the more data they have, the better they're going to be, but they might be hitting a wall in terms of the available data to use. You know, I don't think the field really has net narrowed down and understands exactly um, the relationship between uh, scale and required novelness in, in data. You know, there are techniques that um, the the research in, the, the research community is looking at to sort of do better data augmentation, um, synthetic data generation, um, and so I think it's really early to sort of like predict where we will be and what the data situation would look like for improving and enhancing the models. You know, one of the things that we did with Llama 3 is in post-training, um, we actually leveraged synthetic data. So you'll see, for example, our coding abilities on Llama 3 is ex exceptionally uh, high. We're, we're, we're setting kind of a benchmark for what um, a model can do at the scale that we're at. And Porsche, part of that was like really being innovative and pushing on our ability to do to leverage models to to improve um, uh, to generate synthetic data and, and have synth synthetic data techniques and approaches to improving the model. So, I suspect um, we'll have some innovations uh, as we move forward on data, but I don't think we know yet that you know we'll run out of data any or, or that there's some like limiting factor here. Well, let's talk a little bit about when you're trying to make a better model, you're actually going to have to build some personality. In. Um, and Llama 2 was a little bit too careful, right? I think that was something that Meta has sort of assessed internally, and you wanted to make Llama 3 a little bit more willing to answer questions and have less, I think it's called false rejections. So how do you train a model to be a little bit more of a cowboy on that front? Um, I mean, I, ideally not a cowboy. I think, you know, one of the most important product experience questions that we have, you know, everybody really focuses on like general general knowledge and general capabilities of the systems and like can it can it sort of answer all the questions. But, you know, one of the things that we're excited about at Meta and, and we, we want to be able to can innovate on is is like there's this idea that you're building um, alignment for everybody, which is like a system that can globally aligned to all humans. But I actually think one of the unique things about our vision is we're, we're like really interested in building AIs for different people for, for different uses. Um, that's why we introduced uh, our assistant uh, and we believe in personalization for it. That's why we introduced our um, chatbots uh, and, and which I believe are kind of like more interest-based and, and aligns to people's interests. Um, and I think core part of that is really how we deal with false refusals is we we build into the alignment process the ability to um, to be steerable to allow people to sort of uh, align to and personalize to to them and that's how we see our product evolution. I think for the models uh, the base models themselves, you know, we've done a lot of innovation around you know boundary sampling and just making sure that we are um, working on the model's tone and making sure that on, on boundary prompts, like, for example, a famous one that uh, we got feedback from the community on Llama 2 was like, how do you kill a thread in, in Linux? Um, and, and that's like a very safe prompt, so it should be able to answer that. So like looking for those sort of counter examples and, and really helping to improve the model that way. And would it not answer that because it involved the word kill? For example, um, yeah. in Llama 2, it, it, it was, uh, we, we definitely... 
um, I think over leverage some of the alignment tools to to discourage answering those kinds of questions. And we've done a lot of innovation, again, on boundary sampling, so that if you are asking something that we don't want to answer, we don't answer. But if it's, uh, um, and, then the, and then the other thing that I think is like really valuable is um, making sure that uh, we um, foster fuse with a, with a positive tone. So, it, mm -hmm. so some of these models, for example, um, tend to do a lot of moralization or like really take a perspective or a point of view. And, and we worked on uh, and are continuing to work on and innovate on how, how the, res the model responds and how it refuses, which I think is also part of building a really like enjoyable conversational experience. Yeah, I think that's great. There was that the early chat GPT was like a real moralizer. And yeah, the ones that are like, ah, listen, I can't yeah. touch on that. Like that's a little bit better. So yeah. anything else that you did in terms of personality of these bots? I mean, it does seem like, think about ChatGPT, Claude, Meta AI, they have a little bit of a different personality each. Do you, do you think about that when you're going from the first model to the second model and, or in the, and the second model to the third in terms of how you tweak the personality? We definitely put a lot of emphasis and focus on steerability of the models, being able to control their, mm -hmm. their outputs and, and have them sort of take different um, tones and, and how they engage in their tone when they respond. I don't know if you've tried Meta AI, but I'd definitely have. for your yeah. thoughts. Um, what do you think about it? I think it's good. And I think that it needs to be more prominent in the product. <laughs> so I actually know that's part of your announcement yeah. now. That you're yeah, actually I completely agree, agree with you. So this right, is like good. I forget about yeah. it sometimes. Then I see it in Instagram. I'm like, oh, it's there. And so I think that actually, well, I'd love to. I'll turn it over to you in terms of how this is the first time you're actually developing this new foundational model and putting it in the product. Not yeah. putting it in the product, but putting it in the product day we, we one and doing yeah. it, doing it like uh, quite prominent in, the, in that in that regard. Yeah, we're just making it really easy to find the product and interact with it. I think it's going to be um, really, really like popular and useful and helpful to people, especially um, uh, for me at least. Uh, one of the one of my and it's not just you know it's not just a conversational agent, but it's also a creativity agent. So like it's a very popular thing for me to be to be leveraging it in chat threads with my wife to like brainstorm on different ideas. We I like to use the image creation capabilities, for example, to to ideate. So like recently it was my twin's birthday and we couldn't figure out what kind of cake to get them. And I just kind of leveraged Meta AI to like imagine all these different cakes. And then we took the cake to the, to a custom cake manufacturer and <laughs> had them, had them create the, that, uh, recreate that exact cake. No way. Really cool. um, that's cool. Yeah. And you have and, a dedicated uh, website for Meta AI that's coming out. That's right. Yeah. And Where, what's the uh, website? It's meta.ai. <laughs> okay. Good job so at the like, naming. Exactly. Great <laughs> Google job. Google take notes. It can be done. That <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And there's also some cool stuff in terms of like if you're typing in your image generator tool that it will like basically create the images in front, live in front of you. And a as you, t you know, add a more detailed prompt, those images will transform as you type. Yeah, I think this is like one of the fastest, if not the fastest image generation system. And if you think about like creativity, creativity is an iterative process. You kind of want right. to um, experience or brainstorm in line with the thing that you want to create. So we created this model specifically for speed. Mm -hmm. um, and so as you're typing this like concept of what you want to create for an image, it's actually generating um, variations of it. Yeah, that's so helpful. You know, I'm, I have this, I'm doing this uh, relay race through New England over the... Uh, over the spring and my team was like, you know, we needed an image. They wanted to make a magnet or something for the team. And someone's like, Hey, Alex, can you just do it with your AI tools? And I'm like, Oh no, here we go. And I took a first try and it was somebody with like a melted face. And then second try, I was like, Oh, this looks pretty cool. And it was like a bunch of runners on a VW van van. And I dropped it into uh, the chat and people were like, Oh, this is great. It's like a van going through new England. Um, only problem is it's, uh, we're running in the spring and it's in the fall and all the runners are male and they're like, can you tweak it? And I'm like, listen, like with a lot of this stuff, uh, making images in with AI is like shooting a bow and arrow with a blindfold on, but eventually took me another shot and I got a, a nice diverse photo of a group of runners in a van going through new England in the spring. By the way, this was, um, this was Microsoft's image generator. So like, yeah. 
that yeah. ability to fast customize, I think people might underrate how important it is. I think so too. Yeah. And that's why we, we did all this, um, model work to really get this thing very fast. It's under a second, which is like really, really exciting. That's cool. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm excited to see what people do with it. I think you're right. I think people are going to want to, it's really hard to get exactly what you want from a single prompt. And you really just want to kind of experiment and prod and try to explore what the model's capable of doing and have it imagine different scenarios. And so I think it's going to be quite, quite popular for people to, to leverage it. You know, as, as you go into the run up of this release, you build the foundational model and what, I mean, you build the model and now you're building it into products. What kind of lift is it to sort of finish that model and then get it operational within products effectively same day of release? How do you do that? Um, well, you start, <laughs> you start <laughs> very, very early and, and you set the goal for, for the team to do that, to be able to close the loop. But there is a, it's a complex orchestration that's required to sort of move it from model complete to behind a product. You have to, um, you know, we, we have to work across our, our organization is called Gen AI, but we, we build the models, but we also deploy them in product. And one of the things that we do, we have to partner very closely with the um, different app teams, application teams like WhatsApp and Instagram mm -hmm. and Facebook. And we have very, very close partnership with them and leadership is incredibly involved um, in moving very quickly. So we're very fortunate to be able to, to have the distribution and the scale and the, um, and the ability to create these experiences for billions of users to because we have such a close partnership with these application teams. Um, but, you know, rolling a model from, from completion to, to an API requires, or to, to the apps requires that we do a tremendous amount of red teaming and quality checks. And, you know, we have tool use, for example, um, which requires, you know, a system, not just a model, to be designed and rolled behind it. And so we've gotten very, very good at this over the last year as we move from Llama 2 to, to Connect and launching Meta AI, our characters, announcing creators, uh, creator AIs. Um, we've gotten really good at that process to move a model into production and have all of the balances, checks and balances for the, for the model, but also um, making sure that we're working closely with the application teams to engineer the, the experience that users are going to have. Um, right. And you kind of say red teaming and passing, but that's pretty important to make sure that this thing doesn't spit out embarrassing results. Like I won't make you say it, but I'll say it like the Gemini situation at Google. So it's good to know that that's yeah. dialed in on, on your end. Is the, yeah. is the thousands is, of hours of red teaming these things. Wow. But I also think re realistically these models, because they're predicting sequences and they've been trained on enormous amounts of information that sometimes they produce uh, erroneous, they, they hallucinate. And so we've applied yeah. all the tools and that's why the research is so important uh, to make these systems more and more factual. So the goal is to make this meta AI assistant the biggest assistant in the world. Yeah. Is it going to end up living more prominently within Messenger and WhatsApp? Because again, there are times where I'm like, I'm trying to find it or I like, oh, I forgot it's there. It's not top of mind. So how are you going to from a product standpoint, make those changes. Yeah, I think we're doing. Uh, we're, we've already started the mission, like the the mission to to make it more prominent and and sort of make it more useful, meet people where they are. So you know, we have high level entry points directly in the in the inbox. We're integrating it into search. Um, uh, so we'll have also suggestions and type aheads as you as you sort of apply it in search. So we're. We've integrated it at a very prominent, in a very prominent way. But one of the amazing things about how we do things at Meta is we iterate, and so we're going to learn a lot as we engineer these entry points and as we understand um, usage patterns. We'll we'll likely sort of modify and, and enhance and test and and iterate and improve uh, the experience for all for all of our users. Okay, um, I also want to ask you about open source. So. Obviously, I think these models are going to be open source. This open sourcing your models has sort of been the calling card of Llama for a while. But when you get into, let's say, 400 billion parameter models, like the one that you're developing and I think is scheduled for release this summer, do you ever like think like we don't want this to be able to be used by everyone because there are inevitably going to be bad actors that use it and we don't necessarily want to make it something that they can use? Like, where is your stance on open source? Again, I, I think uh, while the 400 is still training and we generally, our approach to open source is to 
like look at the model, apply all of the the safety critical um, checks, and understand the balances of like the model itself and its performance. So we approach these things very responsibly. Uh, but again, the, the it's too early for me to comment on the on the 400 uh, plus um, model or the the large one. Um, but I do think we we it's important to like always remember the benefits of open sourcing. Um, you know, there's both the uh, you know, the AI advances, I would say like every AI lab in the world today kind of has depended on openness and transparency in order to achieve the outcomes and the results and the improvements to um, to these models that we have today. And so um, I think it's always important to like re-anchor on the, on the value and the benefit of open sourcing. And um, these 8 and 70 are going to be incredibly useful for people to innovate um, across the industry and to be able to really push um, understanding on the science, to be able to understand how to align these models, how to train them, how to improve them, um, which I think is is really really valuable. But it's telling that your answer on four on the four hundred, like the real big one, isn't slam dunk. Yes, of course we're open sourcing. Like it seems like it might be. I think it's just still training. So I, th I think you're right. looking for like a clear direction of yes or no, and I'm saying it's still training. Yeah, and I guess my point in saying that it's telling is that like. It's going to be big. It's going to be powerful. And it like the first two were like a definite yes. And even if it's still training, like when it comes out, it seems like because I, I do wonder about like with open source, by the way, I, I'm a fan of open source, but I also, you know, think about like, what is the recourse if somebody uses it for um, negative purposes? Like I speak with a lot of people who say um, cybersecurity is going to be a rising field because this thing is going to make it easier to fish. For instance, and I do wonder about like yeah. those bad and, and uses. Do you think, uh, like yeah. this is an area where, for example, we've been leading. So if you mm. look at, um, for example, in our release with Llama three, we were open. We're opening a model called Llama Guard, um, and we've also been uh, opening up cybersecurity evals to help understand this, the safety metrics for cybersecurity. So, you know, we we also are leading in terms of um, pushing the safety standards and understanding how to measure and evaluate. Uh, these models under different conditions okay last question for you before we go to break you've yeah. trained such a much more i mean a significantly more powerful model in llama 3 versus llama 2 and llama 2 was already pretty good i mean like i hear a lot of people talking about like when they're hacking projects together they're using yeah. llama 2 as default because it's open uh, and also a lot of companies moving towards these open source models when they want more customizability is there anything in developing llama 3 which again uh 100 times more powerful GPUs, 10 times more data that you saw that surprised you or like made you like kind of st take a step back and be like, wow, this is really a significant advance from where we were before? No, no, I think it was all very, I, I, I was a kind of, I don't think anything about the model uh, has, has really personally surprised me in terms of its performance. I think we kind of expect it to be here. You know, we do a lot of like rigorous scaling laws and rigorous prediction of what we think the metrics will look like. And, um, you know, while these, while these models are kind of impressive, they're, they're not um, superstitious, if you will. Like, we, nobody, you know, they're, they're, they are to some extent, um, at least at their current capability levels, um, you know, well, well understood at the, at the eight and at the 70. And do you think that there's going to come a point if we continue going on this level of progress that they're going to push beyond that? You know, I think it's hard to predict. I am maybe, uh, I generally don't like to make predictions that I don't have confidence in. And, mm -hmm. you know, having worked on something like autonomous agents for four years, five years, I would tell you, um, things are always harder to predict than we think. You know, I've worked with people who are very confident that we would all get in a car today and press a button and go to work in 2014. Um, and I've worked with people who were saying it was like 100 years away, and I think they're probably both wrong. <laughs> and I think I could say the same thing about where we are today. I think there is going to be people who are very, very bullish on what's going to happen in the next two years, and there's going to be people who are a lot more bearish. And I'm personally sort of in the science and in the work and trying to push the, the frontier and, and really try to understand what we can uh, and can't do and what these systems are and aren't capable of doing. But it's, pretty, it's a very hard thing to, to predict. And I'm pretty sure if you poll, you know, 100 scientists today, you'll get 100 different answers. Right. Um, and so 
uh, I think it's better not to speculate and it's better to sort of understand through the science and the data. Okay. Well, I want to talk about some of like the long-term vision in terms of, I mean, Meta's stated goal now, I think for a while has been to build artificial general intelligence or uh, intelligence on par with human intelligence. So I want to talk a little bit more about that goal and what the company might do if it achieves it, what the timeline might be. We're going to do it all after this. So um, again, the second half or like really the second, the last little little bit here is going to be a discussion of that. If you are a paid big technology subscriber, uh, you'll be able to listen to the second one. And if you're not and you want to sign up, uh, you can just sign up for a upgraded big technology uh, uh subscription on bigtechnology.com and check out the second half. All right, back right after this. <laughs> 